I want to talk to you today about the seven signs of abandonment issues, how you can identify them, what they cause, what they do, and most importantly, how you can recover from this. And keep in mind that these seven are just, once again, the big broad strokes. There's a lot more to unpack, but just so that you can get a head start on this, I wanted to share this with you especially because I have been, as I've been working more and more with my clients and getting into the root cause of their issue, their symptoms, believe it or not, so often we actually find that the cause at the root was abandonment issues. And people, I think, don't really understand what that is. But again, there will be some indicators, some signs in your life, especially in your relationships, where these things show up. And that's how you can pinpoint very quickly whether this is something that applies to you and I hope you're doing really well today so let's get into it first of all how uh, just again very big picture and then I'm going to give you the seven ways on how you can specifically identify right uh, one of the big ones is that you have an overwhelming fear of losing loved ones or people that you really care about and even though it's not a warranted fear makes no sense there are no indications that that person is sick or might be leaving you or anything might be happening but you have this deeply rooted fear that they might be losing you um, you mistrust other people you have a very hard time getting close to people and we're going to unpack that a little bit later in one of the points more specifically and basically you have an anxiety of being abandoned now the real reason for this big anxiety that a lot of people experience is actually childhood trauma. And by the way, before you turn away and run away from this word and think that it doesn't apply to you, because often the word trauma in itself is massively misunderstood. People often think trauma are only those big obvious things like war, like physical, mental, emotional abuse, like the real, you know, the real harsh things. And of course, those are the obvious ones, right? But there are so many other types of trauma. And let me explain to you like this. A child up until the age of eight, give or take, you know, doesn't really, doesn't have a logical, doesn't have the ability to think logically yet. It doesn't have the capacity of the conscious mind yet. It doesn't have the ability to differentiate, basically, is this good, is this bad? Is there a past? Is there a future? Is this right? Is this wrong? They very much live in the moment. And the only way they can navigate their situation and then make meaning out of that situation is through what they're feeling, through their emotions. And so they either feel good or bad. They either feel safe or unsafe. And you can be assured that somewhere, and this probably didn't just happen one time, but it probably happened several times. There was a moment or moments where you felt abandoned. You felt lost. You felt left behind. You felt like they forgot about you or anything like that. And again, keep in mind, very often, even with my clients, when we get to the root cause, they immediately will judge this little kid or poo poo and say, oh, come on, big deal. So you were, you know, you were stuck in the car for a minute, big deal. Your mom just ran into the 7-Eleven. I don't understand, like, why, why would that cause a child to be upset, right? If it just was literally moments. Well, remember, a child doesn't have the concept of time. All it has is the experience of this particular moment. And this particular moment for that child, it looked around, holy cannoli, nobody's here. Nobody's here to save me. Nobody's here to protect me. I'm going to die. L like children, and, and even smaller, right? Little children literally think fatally like that because they know intuitively that they have to depend on the adults around them, the caretakers around them. And for that reason, this thought and then ultimately becomes a belief happens so quickly in a split second. And even more importantly, in that moment, the subconscious mind takes a snapshot of that experience and within split seconds decides, you know what, being alone, bad, right? You're going to die, whatever. It, it's, it's a very kind of a twisted 
psychology and even mentality. But remember, to a child, this is very real. This is very uh, visceral. This is very, very deep. And it can, it can literally cause years and years of anxiety down the line. Just a small, what we consider adults, a small moment, right? So for a child, this is not a small thing. This is a massive thing. And this is what people don't, don't realize that, you know, some of these experiences, cause so often my clients will argue and I don't blame them. I understand they'll say, I never had trauma. My parents were amazing. I had the most wonderful childhood. I had the most peaceful. They gave me everything I could ever wanted. You know, I grew up in a glass castle with gold. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm kidding, right? But you know, some people who literally are spoon being spoon fed, right? For good or bad, doesn't matter. And to them, it's not obvious that they had trauma. But once we unpack this and once we get to understand what actually really happened from the perspective of that little baby or that little child, all of a sudden the world starts to look completely different. And then little by little, as I do my spoon feeding with hypnotherapy, it is my job, my job to show my client. And can you see how from a child's perspective, you started to feel these emotions. You didn't have the ability, the, the skill set, the support on how to process, how to understand, how to unpack this event. And therefore, those emotions stayed locked within you, as well as the beliefs that you started to develop. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. And that often was the exact onset because the emotions stayed locked in, the beliefs will then cause a lot of self-sabotage and pain and, and really, you know, difficult relationships. And until we resolve that original, those emotions, and we help that person heal and process those and help them eliminate those limiting beliefs that, you know, maybe in the, in the moment they were really appropriate and warranted. But fast forward, you know, sometimes 30, 40, 50 years go by and that person still lives with those limiting beliefs and believes those limiting beliefs and that's what causes a lot of problems then later on so again keep in mind that really the most important thing is that something like this can manifest in negative behavior and difficult relationships so here are the seven signs and again remember this is not an exhaustive exhaustive list it's just sort of broad strokes right so, and also this is not in any particular order, not from worst to best or best to worst, no such thing. It just, these are just the indicators. So the first one I have for you is somebody eventually becomes a people pleaser. They will often put other people's needs first. They will bend over backwards to make sure that, in other words, they feel responsible for other people's happiness. And they also feel very uncomfortable. Let's just say they're having a great day. And all of a sudden they come across somebody who has a miserable day or they're just in a bad mood. And now they literally feel like they have to bring themselves down. They have to kind of tone down that happiness because they feel responsible. Because if I'm happy, how who do I think I am to be happy? I should cower down to sort of their level of mood and attitude. And, you know, very often a people pleaser will want to impress they need a lot of acknowledgement. They need a lot of approval. They will sometimes even have the attitude, I will do anything, just please don't leave me. And those might not even be words, but this is what they might show through their actions. And unfortunately, you know, as well-meaning as that may seem, very often these people get hurt really badly because not only is this behavior not very attractive, but they get exhausted in the meantime because they do and they run and they try and they strive and they they literally just are the most creative creatures right on on really trying to please their partner and not putting their their own needs often don't even matter or they don't think they matter and this becomes just a very exhaustive way of of living and most often the partner doesn't consider this behavior very attractive or or with the very wrong partner this partner will then abuse and take advantage right of somebody like that so the next one is they're struggling with insecurity 
So this is sort of very often the person who has perfectionist tendencies. They will compare themselves to other people. They feel like they, they're not measuring up. They are very often struggling with body image issues. You know, I should be this, I should be that, I should be further along. They often will think that in success or in career and in business, they should be a certain way or they, you know, so a lot of comparison going on here. And, um, like deep down, they might feel that I am not good enough or I am not worthy of love or attention. And they're always afraid that people might leave them because of that insecurity. Am I good enough? Do I measure up? Are they going to leave me? You know, is this is this a problem? Do I act appropriately? And the questions and the constant's got to be perfect and it has to be just so, again, just exhaustive, right? The next one is they have a hard time trusting people. Now, this is a tricky one because on one hand, they really, really yearn for a relationship. They yearn for intimacy. They really want passion, not only to receive, but also to give. But somewhere, somehow, they also learned trusting people is not good. When you trust people, they will leave you. When you trust people, they will hurt you. And the repetition of that has become so manifested and so ingrained, that is what will cause the, you know, I'm going to, you know, don't leave me. But something, I, I read this a quote, this was so good, and I can remember what it was. But something like, I'm holding on to you, but don't leave me, or anyhow. Um, so they often want to be in control. They are unfortunately often labeled as, the control freak, right? Or they become very possessive. They will, you know, check in 65 times a day on what are you doing? Who are you with? And, you know, who else is there? And when, when are you coming home? Why were you not coming home on time? And, and so the constant questioning, inquisitiveness, and again, just keep in mind, that's really frustrating to a partner who actually uh, means well, and they actually can be trusted. But if you know, if you're on the other side of this, don't take it personally, because remember, that person is handling this relationship from their perspective and what they have experienced. And ultimately, they learned that they can't trust human beings. So, you know, patience is required. And of course, I mean, listen, somebody like that, really, the best thing is for them to take responsibility for this and begin the healing process and start to get to the bottom of this so that they can finally enjoy a healthy, good relationship, right? Uh, number four, they are scared of vulnerability, which is very much like the trust issue. Again, even though their heart is full and they really just want to give and receive, and but they will sabotage the best relationships because, again, from a very twisted psychology, how we are all wired, believe it or not, is whatever that fundamental program is that we learned and saw as children is what became, here it is, the comfortable and familiar, in quote, right, program. And unfortunately, our nervous system, unless we are experiencing that same, which of course is very often a very unhealthy relationship, our nervous system actually will reject it and then often we will reject the best, kindest, most loving people because it just doesn't feel familiar. And this is where the self-sabotage comes in. And this is why the healing is so important so that you can let go and so that your nervous system doesn't continuously crave this old, unhealthy and, and almost um, abusive pattern, if that makes sense, right? Uh, number five is very similar. These are all very similar, but this person, almost like in a strange way, will always look for reasons to leave. And they will find the smallest and the biggest ways. And okay, that, that's it. That's it. You know, I'm, I'm leaving. And they will often move on way too quickly, not giving the other person an opportunity, a chance, even a little test here and there to say, you know, maybe this relationship is worth pursuing. Maybe this relationship is worth having. And it takes a give and take, right? And and playing this um, interaction with each other and, and giving grace to each other. And a person who has abandonment issues, although has a very hard time with giving grace because the fear underneath is so big. That's 
that's all they can be concerned with. And they have not yet been able to kind of um, get to the other side of that. And the fear is what dominates their thoughts, their feelings, and their behaviors. And the last one, I'm sorry, six is um, just being really clingy, which I think is a bit obvious, right? And often they will also, again, I don't want to use this word, but it comes just so naturally they will attract the wrong person, the wrong partner, just because this is an old, deeply ingrained pattern. And unless we break it, this will be very hard to break because those are the only people they feel, here's that quote unquote again, on, um, they feel comfortable with, right? And the last indicator, which probably also is so obvious, but very often overlooked, because these are the exact things that often get medicated, that actually the symptoms reveal something completely different. And the symptoms of something like this, the physical symptoms are irritability, mood swings, anxiety, depression, not being able to sleep, um, not feeling good in your skin, aches and pains in your body, very often issues with digestion, big issues with digestion. Those can all be indicators. But just now imagine if all we do is medicate this. That's kind of like putting a big band-aid on a massive wound that actually might even require surgery. So it's, in my opinion, it's the most irresponsible thing we can do. And yes, in the beginning, it can be useful, of course, just to give that peace, that person peace of mind initially, right, until they get help. I can totally get behind that. But typically, it's not a long-term solution because, again, what will really serve somebody so that they can let go of those symptoms where the body can relax again and feel comfortable and feel um, feel safe again is recognizing that our body produces these symptoms because it is angry. It wants attention. It wants to communicate something to us and it has something important to tell us. And this is why I love and adore hypnotherapy because it gives us the opportunity to have a conversation in peace and quiet a certain way because we're talking to the subconscious mind and we get to understand what or ask what do all these symptoms actually indicate? What's the real message? What's the real meaning? And because our subconscious mind communicates to us through metaphors and symbolism and emotions and memories and images and pictures and sounds and there's just so much, right? Think about the ratio, the conscious mind is has the capacity like a flea and the subconscious mind is like an elephant. So there's a wealth of information underneath your conscious awareness. And when we can tap into that, that's when the sky will open up for you. That's when you will get some insights that you're like, man, I didn't know what I didn't know. And through that observation, that investigation, you get to connect the dots. And that's when you get will get to start to understand some things about yourself, about your life, maybe your caregivers. And ultimately, it will cause for your physical body, for your mind to eventually relax and be like, now I understand. Now I can see why I have been hypervigilant. Now I can see why I'm such a worrywart. Now I can see why I keep catastrophizing the future. Now I see why I've been so fearful. Now I can see why, you know, I'm, I don't let people in, right? And that's literally in the process, even in that first session of hypnotherapy, that's when the transformation starts to take place and the healing starts to take place and the pieces start to fall into place and you literally, even with a big leap, with that first interaction of communicating with your subconscious mind, you will experience so much relief and so much understanding and insight. And again, this is where I've seen a massive difference between traditional therapy and hypnotherapy. It just goes so much deeper. You get much more information in a much shorter time and the transformation also happens much quicker. And this is why I am a massive fan of hypnotherapy. And also I wanna share, I think this is very important that I quite frankly don't take responsibility necessarily for 
hypnotherapy as an idea, as a concept, as a tool, because remember, it's, it's a tool and each practitioner will u- utilize that tool in their own way, how they have learned, how they deem it necessary, possible, appropriate, whatever. And I have developed my own formula on how I like to work and I have literally learned from the best of the best. My best teachers, by the way, are my clients always. I always learn so much in each session, but ultimately my hypnotherapy, the way it is a massive fusion of many, many different things, modalities, techniques. And so therefore I can only take responsibility for my work and how I work, not just hypnotherapy as a general idea, because it's an art and a science and depending on the practitioner, depending on their level of competence as well as confidence, I think those are massive factors. And rapport has to be there. And there are many other factors that should be in place for this to work for you beautifully. So I want to spotlight and make make a point of that because, you know, hypnotherapy could literally be something like reading a script to somebody, which, I mean... I'm not even get into that, but there are so many ways what people consider to be hypnotherapy. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I have just found a way that works efficiently, effectively. I appreciate it. I love it. My clients feel very, very cared for because think about it. We are exploring some vulnerable topics, some difficult topics, and unless you feel safe and unless you feel good and comforted in the presence, right, of the person who's working with you, you're not really going to get to the depth that you need to get or want to get. And then that's really not the best use of your time. And my idea is let's do some good work. Let's do some meaningful work, okay? So I hope this resonated with you. And obviously, as you already know, my idea of how can we get the healing as fast as possible You already know that it's hypnotherapy, but if you want to start doing some work on your own, I have a lot of free uh, resources in my bio. You can go in there, download some really cool stuff. There is uh, one book in there that I believe is how, How to Heal Childhood Trauma. That might be a really good way to start. I also have another book that is called Create a Better Life or Your Best Life, something like that. And even just that book in itself asks you some really interesting questions that you might like to uh, spend some time with and ponder upon and start there. And otherwise, of course, if you want to reach out to me personally, feel free to do so. You can always DM me. I look forward to uh, hearing from you soon. And again, hope this was useful and remember to be good to yourself. And by the way, what I always do now is I post my lives on Facebook and then I bring them over to YouTube. So feel free to follow me. Probably a safer way to follow me is YouTube because I don't know, somehow I trust that platform a little bit more. I've had some really good success and really good feedback from people over there. Um, It seems like my community is growing on YouTube rapidly and I also love the interaction with people. And I always, always love when you guys comment or ask questions, or just share something, you know, meaningful, um, because I do love to interact. So thanks for that. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule. And remember to be good to yourself. I'll see you soon.